Sounds good. Hello, everyone. Welcome to um, February's Second Saturdays. I'm Alyssa Hunt, the Program Director at the Alice Paul Institute, and I am so pleased to have you here with us today. Um, I want to acknowledge Comcast. Their generous support allows us to provide these programs free to our community, um, so thank you to them. And thank you to Bonnie Croyle and Starlisha Gingrich for joining us here today. Bonnie is the founder of the Ebenezer Project, and Starlisha is the founder and director of the Disrupt Theater Company. And I am just going to turn it on over to them and let them tell you about themselves, about the work they do and why it matters so much. If you have any questions or comments, please drop them in the chat box and we will uh, send them over. And so without further ado. Awesome. Alyssa, thank you so much for hosting us today. We are just so excited to be here holding space with everyone. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Like Alyssa said, my name is Benita Croyle. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a good friend of today's speaker, Starlisha Gingrich. I'm also the founder of the Ebenezer Project, an organization where I work to empower change makers working for justice in Anabaptist and Mennonite communities. I am delighted to be here holding space with each of you as your moderator today. And I look forward to hearing your questions later today when we open it up for the question and answer section. We want today's webinar to feel like a conversation and we value your feedback. So if at any time you have questions, go ahead and pop those in the chat. A little housekeeping um, for those of you familiar with Zoom, you'll know that when you put the questions in the chat, you'll have options about who you wanna send that to. Make sure that you are sending it to all the hosts or you can send it to everyone so that everyone can also see what you have to say. Um, I also want to acknowledge that although we are meeting virtually today, we want to acknowledge that many of us are meeting from colonized indigenous land, land which was stolen through genocide, slavery, and the forced removal of indigenous peoples. I am cognizant as I hold space here in Tucson, Arizona. It's the land of the Pascoyaki and the Tohono O'odham Nation. And it's important to both Starlisha and I that we name and honor the peoples whose land we meet on because we believe that Black and Indigenous liberation must be intersectional. It is my honor today to introduce you to my friend, Starlisha Gingrich, who has asked to introduce herself. So Star, go ahead. In true fashion. Thank you, Bonnie, so much. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for having us. Thank you to the Alice Paul Institute for reaching out and um, asking for this conversation. It is definitely something that I am incredibly passionate about, as I think you'll see. Um, I live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is the land of the Susquehannock and Conestoga Indian tribes. And um, I work in theater. We're just going to leave it at that for today. I am a theater professional. I am um, a creative. I'm a storyteller. And I usually self-describe myself as a mirror and a lens. So I am a reflection of what I hold dear to my heart and a lens of my view of the world. I've had the opportunity to work with several amazing theater companies. And in 2020, I decided to launch Disrupt Theater Company, which was a plan uh, that was born in a late, late summer, I believe, or early fall of 2018. So it took about a year and a half to have things really come to fruition. And I, I will dig into that story in a little bit through some of our questions. I am also a facilitator through my local YWCA's Center for Racial and Gender Equity. We hold racial equity institutes, which um, are open to anyone. You don't have to live in Lancaster if you would like to attend any of those. Um, and we can put that um, website in the chat. It's ywcalancaster.org if you're interested in the work that we are doing at the um, CRGE. I am passionate about helping people assess their diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice needs and developing long-term plans and strategies to bolster those efforts within their organizations or companies. I studied theater. This is the boring credentialing things. Um, I've been acting since I was five, but I formally studied theater at Messiah University, which is 15 minutes south of our state capital in Harrisburg. And I studied community-based theater in, in Queens, New York in the summer of 2018, 
with the award-winning Cornerstone Theater Company. And community-based theater is something that I hold dear to my heart as well. And that is something that I hope to bring to different communities as I grow my um, company passions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I live with a cat named Beans and I also live with another cat named Cookie. Cookie might get curious and pop in frame at some point. She loves to see who I'm talking to. And I am continually surrounded by plays that I someday hope to produce. Um, I just have stacks of plays everywhere and starting to kind of overwhelm the house. But that is a little bit about me. Um, yeah, awesome. and again, I'm so excited to be here with all of you. I see some familiar names in the chat. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And Star, before we get started, I just want to remind everyone, as we are getting here with our questions, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. We want to hear where you're coming from. We want to hear what interested you. If you want to share your professional contact information, you can do that as well. Please send that to all panelists and attendees so that we can all see who's here today. You feel comfortable. Um, Star, I want to start with our first question for today. The theme for today's conversation is reimagining imagined spaces. As the founder of Disrupt Theater, the first black owned theater company in your county, can you tell us what your process was like? What began your journey of reimagination? Sure. Um, so I moved to Lancaster in August of 2015 because I had outgrown my creative opportunities in the town I was living in previously, which is State College, Pennsylvania, as we all know, is the home of Penn State University. I just decided that I needed a change. So I moved to Lancaster where a lot of my friends were and a lot of my college friends were. And my first theater gig here was with a theater called Prima Theater. And they're a company slash organization that really focuses on fresh theatrical experiences. And they were young and hip, and honestly, they had no problem casting Black people, Brown people, Indigenous people, other people of color, LGBTQ folks. There was a myriad of people on their stages consistently from the time that they started their theater company to this past year. Um, this past year, they actually did Godspell with a Black woman playing Jesus, which I think is yes. amazing. We love to see it. We <laughs> love to see it. Taylor Harris is amazing. Um, so I, as I dug into my work here with other theaters, I saw very few examples of those types of companies that were valuing having black and brown bodies on stage and in their seasons. I do have to give a brief shout out to Creative Works of Lancaster, who I consider my theatrical home, and Teatro Paloma, which is our Latinx theater company here in Lancaster. And without either of them and all of those people who were involved there, Disrupt would literally just be a one page idea in my Google Docs. So I owe a lot to the people that I sought out within the first mm -hmm. few months of living here in Lancaster. So as we jokingly say in the theater, in the theater industry, I was hashtag blessed to join different companies on their stages. And a lot of times it was in shows where I was a part of the oppressed ensemble. Um, one of my first musicals here was Big River the Musical, which is the story of Huckleberry Finn. And I got to play an enslaved woman who got to sing about reaching freedom. And I have done Hairspray twice. I did it once in State College and once here in Lancaster. And both times I was obviously in the Negro Day cast. And I, the second time I did it was a little bit better than the first time. But since then, I have really started taking a helicopter view of that show in particular, because it is such a well-known show. People love Hairspray. The tunes are fun. The dancing is hard. You lo I lost a lot of weight doing that show. It was in the best shape of my life. Um, but then I realized just in the last few years that that is a, a Black people show. And that is a Black people show for white people written by white people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really mm -hmm. dig into truly the black experience. So I realized through some of these experiences that I had two choices. Number one, I could continue to publicly call out white male dominated theater companies, or number two, I could do something about it. So I decided to do something about it. And from the moment I threw out the idea on 
Facebook about a black centered theater company. I had so many likes and comments of support. I just knew that I had to do it. So that was kind of the beginning of the journey. Um, and then I was in a show in March of 2020. It's crazy. It's wild to me to think that like a year ago I was yeah. on a stage somewhere. Um, and a friend came up to me, a friend who's actually on the board of Creative Works of Lancaster came up to me and said, hey, when are you starting your theater company? Here's the situation that arose today. You are the solution. When are you going to do it? And I was like, oh, Ooh. I was just kind of <laughs> waiting for someone to say that to me. So I guess I'll do it. Um, <laughs> There's your so sign. that was right. I was like, oh, this is like the thing that I need to do. So in March 2020, I sat on my couch on like day one or two of lockdown. And I had a virtual meeting with a few people from Creative Works. And they kind of ran me through how they started and how Teatro Ploma started. And they were like, you know what? Starly show you have our support you have our backing you have our financial support should you ever need it do it so I did it yeah oh thank you star um and we're going to keep talking about disrupt as we go um I have a question for you just as we're thinking about um theater in the pandemic and theater uh redreaming it um if you could wave a magic wand and build a brand new theater landscape what would your reimagination of theater look like what would it feel like? What would feel essential to have in this world? That's a great question. So for me, it looks like a few things. Uh, number one, it looks like financial accessibility for audiences. Um, it looks like feeling at home when you step into a theater. It looks like white driven theater companies hiring BIPOC folks and LGBTQ plus folks to consult on these matters of diversity, equity, and justice. And what we as often marginalized communities look for, need and want to build in our, in our perfect theater world. It also looks like divesting from capitalism a little bit. Mm -hmm. I had a meeting with a regional theater artistic director a few weeks ago, and he expressed that he doesn't necessarily want to only do commercial musicals and commercial in this case is often traditionally white musicals with white casts that cater to affluent white audiences but he has to keep the lights on, right? Like there's always that mm -hmm. matter of paying the bills. And he was expressing to me that what is great about the, that theater in particular is that they have the ability to do less mainstream shows in their smaller studio space. And they're actually building a secondary studio space that will be used for smaller local theaters to use to break down those barriers and really become a welcoming place and welcome audiences in who don't necessarily feel comfortable going to the main stage space. So those are just a few things and we'll dig into that, I think a little bit more as we go on. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, what do you hope to encourage a Disrupt Theater and why are spaces like Disrupt so important? Sure, so part of our mission at Disrupt is to bring stories of BIPOC and LGBTQ communities uh, to those communities. And because of the prevalence of systemic racism in our world, but also in the larger theater community, these communities are often left out at the local and regional level. I know people who have never stepped foot in our local regional theater that I was speaking about before, because they assume they have to shell out over $100 just for the ticket, right? And I think part of the responsibility for black and brown theater makers is to break down these misconceptions. So when I think of theater and growing up, um, I think a little bit less, I think of this now that I'm kind of in it, in the business side of things. Um, but growing up, when I thought of theater, I thought about a night on Broadway, going to Broadway, right? Spending money. I live in rural Pennsylvania. I grew up in very rural Pennsylvania. You had to drive like an hour and a half to get to a train station. So you're spending money on a train ticket, right? Um, you're spending money on dinner, you're spending money on a souvenir or a snack in the, once you get into the theater. And then I'm a dessert girl. I always go for dessert after shows. Um, so then you're spent, I'm spending money on dessert and then I'm spending money on a train ticket home. And when it's mm -hmm. all said and done, that's about $200 per person. If you're talking, if we're talking about like going to the theater in New York, right. My goal with Disrupt is to eliminate the view that we have to spend a billion dollars to enjoy some entertainment. 
Our first show that Disrupted was sponsored by Creative Works, like I said, and we were able to present it during over Zoom and only with a suggested donation of $5, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, and I really dream of being able to do that for the rest of our existence. And because of capitalism, money doesn't work like that but it's my goal to keep this model in place as much as I can and for as long as I can. Um, and then you ask why are spaces like Disrupt important? I think they're important for a lot of reasons, but I'm going to keep it to one example. The show I produced in August was Smart People by Lydia R. Diamond. She's a black playwright. Everyone should go read this play. It's amazing. And the cast was four people, a black man, a white man, a black woman, and a Chinese, Japanese, American woman. And since we were presenting this as a staged reading, so the actors didn't have to be memorized, and it was over Zoom, I had the need for someone to read the stage directions as well. So I hired a Latina actress to do that. There was a moment where my assistant director, Sophia, who is a Korean American woman, my Chinese American actress, Lois, and I had all finished up rehearsing some things for Lois for a few of her scenes. And we stayed on the call just for a little bit, just to have some chatting time. And we talked about life. We talked about reality TV. We talked about dating. We talked about, you know, whatever just kind of came up. We're just three friends hanging out. And Sophia stopped mid-sentence and said, I just realized that in all of my years doing theater, this is the first moment I've been in a rehearsal with zero white people. Mm. And mm -hmm. Lois and I were like, oh yeah, that's <laughs> was like, wait a second, that is amazing and awful all at the same time. And those moments are the reason why I created Disrupt. They're so few and far between. And I want to gift that experience to my black and brown and LGBTQ theater friends and collaborators. Yeah, that was a powerful example. And Star, I'm going a little off script here, but I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about the power of representation, because as you're talking about, that's the first time um, and knowing your friends, we're in our 20s, right? So knowing that it takes that long for... <laughs> um, sure, I'm in my 20s, absolutely. <laughs> I cheated with you. <laughs> um, but knowing that it takes that long for the power of representation, for us to experience it. And so you're pioneering here. You're building what you're also um, experiencing, right? Um, what your dreams are, you're inviting people to pioneer with you. And I think that's so powerful. Can you speak a little bit more about the power of representation in disruption? theater? Sure. So I, I grew up going to the theater. Um, my parents put me in theater camp at age five. I can name some of the earliest shows that I saw. I actually saw a tour of, it's actually a really great example to, that goes into your question. Um, so the show I was speaking about earlier, Big River is a musical, and mm -hmm. I actually saw a tour of it at the Hershey Theater here in Pennsylvania. And it was the Deaf West touring company, theater company. And they are a theater company that employs deaf actors. And mm -hmm. the, the, each role was double cast. So you have um, a deaf actor and a hearing actor. And they play the same role. And the hearing actor speaks the lines. And the deaf actor signs the lines. Signs the lines. And it was such a beautiful production. And... It was so much fun. And that is like peak representation, I think, um, as we talk so much about accessibility and not only financial accessibility, but accessibility to any type of bodies, whether you have, a, have hearing loss, whether you have sight loss, um, whether you are a wheelchair user, whatever that looks like, theater should be accessible. Yeah. And I think that for communities that have been so widely marginalized because of our, the history, particularly our history of anti-Blackness in America, I think that showing people that we can do things that have been labeled, incorrectly labeled as white activities mm -hmm. is so important. Um, I had an interview with a local news station, which is actually the first black owned media company here in central Pennsylvania, first and only. 
And I was chatting with three of the women who have a podcast and they brought me on for an interview. And the one woman was like, oh yeah, like I grew up here and I've never been to this regional theater. And I said, you know, I, I have, and I've sat at literally every single level in that theater. I have paid money to sit like in the orchestra. And I was like, but I'm going to let you in on a secret. You can pay $28 and sit in the very top of the theater. And they were blown away. They had no idea Mm -hmm. that that model was accessible to them. Mm -hmm. And I think that with companies like Disrupt and Teatro Paloma and Creative Works, I think we are just trying to eliminate that barrier as much as possible, whether that's performing in a park, whether that is um, pay what uh, Creative Works does a pay what you think it's worth model. So at the end of the show, they pass the hat, (laughs) right? So you can, you can pay like, oh, this was amazing. Here's $10. Mm -hmm. Or you can be like, it was fine. Here's $2. Like they don't judge. Um, They, they're a nonprofit, right? Like it's just, it's donation based. Um, So I think that is, I, I feel like I talk so much about the money, the money, the money, but that's not only it, right? Like it is about that representation in the rehearsal room. And it is about the representation the audiences see on stage. And honestly, I think a lot of it has to start with the children. Um, Mm -hmm. As someone who works in education, I, I talk to my students a lot about, you know, like the world in general. Um, But I think there's, there's often a disconnect between kids in marginalized communities and activities like going to the theater. Um, Mm -hmm. I remember when Black Panther came out, every Black kid I knew and every Black person I knew saw it at least twice in theaters. Yes. Um, I could have seen it like (laughs) eight times in theater. And dressed (laughs) up, people like showed out. And that, like, that's what I want Black and Brown people to do for the theater. It's really, truly no different um, than going to, well, it's a little different than going to see a movie, but I want that same experience of excitement and like, oh, I am going to see myself and most importantly, I'm going to see myself in on stage in a role that is not oppressive, where I'm not like fighting for desegregation or freedom or what have you, right? Yeah. Um, yes. So um, start, we question. have a question. Yeah. Thank you. And we have a question that will align with some of our ones that we have later. But I want to ask it now. I love um feeling conversational in this. So this question says, I've been reading a lot lately about how representation of black indigenous people of color often only focuses on stories of trauma. Can you speak to the need to disrupt this trend? I'm thinking of the legacy of Cicely Tyson here as well, and how she was an early champion of displaying agency. That's a great question. And one that I'm actually currently in the middle of struggling with um, for Disrupt um, because I think that there's there's a very fine line here, right? There's a fine line between quote unquote, for lack of a better term, the black experience and on the other side of that line is trauma, right? Like I feel like that line is walked very delicately Um, and I think that I can sit here and I can say, and I have been saying this, I've had so many conversations just in the last few months with my white theater friends about this, where I'm like, I don't want your theater to, in 2021, to produce a show that is about black people not having agency, like just do a a black joy show. And then I started thinking about it. And I, I lectured this to several people, one of my friends in particular, multiple times. And then I started really thinking about it. And I was coming up short. And I just said to myself, Starlisha, where are all these plays with Black joy in them? And of course, I don't know every Black playwright in the world. But the ones that are most popular often have a little bit of that through line of trauma, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it's, It's unfortunate because that is the black his, the, that is the historical experience of black descendants of slavery, African American descendants of slavery here in America. Like there is trauma because of systemic racism, right? 
And that's not to say that there aren't those joyful plays out there. I'm, that's like one of my tasks for next month is to really start digging in and finding those plays. Um, but I think that there's that need because I don't, I don't enjoy watching a lot of black trauma on stage. So I don't want to force anyone else to do that. So the flip side of this coin um, is putting black actors in roles that have traditionally been cast as white. Um, so a, a number of years ago, we started having this conversation in the theater community about colorblind casting. And that was, that was a whole thing. White directors were like, I don't care what color you are. If you're the best for the role, I'm gonna cast you. Great, period, end of sentence. Fine, but then we started seeing this trend of black actors being cast in roles that were perpetuating negative stereotypes about black people, even though it's not in the script, but seeing a black person in that role per was perpetuating the negative stereotype. So we moved away from the colorblind conversation and moved into color conscious casting. And that is something that I'm very cognizant of um, so for, for example, and I'm going to get a little theatery here, for example, there is a Rodgers and Hammerstein, <laughs> uh, great, I'm not, I'm glad, um, there's a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical called Carousel, I grew up listening to the soundtrack, it was one of the first musicals I ever watched, my best friend up the road had the VHS, and we would watch it all the time, and I knew that score front and back in my sleep, I had the choreography of the opening like overture in my head and there's the the main male character is an abusive man so when the carousel revival popped up on broadway a number of years ago joshua henry who is a phenomenal actor and he's a black actor was cast as billy bigelow and he's super and cute. he's <laughs> super cute and super cute <laughs> Um, his voice is like just so rich and baritone and just wonderful. He did, I, I had the opportunity to see that show and I didn't take it. And that's one of my biggest theater regrets of the last <laughs> six years of my life. Um, so to, for, okay, Joshua Henry and the lead character is Julie Jordan. And she was played by a white woman, Jesse Mueller, shout out Jesse Mueller, um, who's wonderful, phenomenal, beautiful singer, beautiful woman, beautiful actress. Um, and I, in my head was like, this is problematic, but in a fascinating way, because you have this black man playing an abusive role and this white woman, where even if, she, even if the, lead male role was played by a white man is still being harmed and oppressed but I'm like it's a fact it was kind of that was kind of like the shifting point I think for the conversation for me where I'm like this was great because vocally they both knock it out of the park and I'm sure they acted it super well but that sparks a conversation right that talks mm -hmm. that starts the conversation of what does it look like to put black men in particular in roles where they are harmful to white women we have this long standing history in America of black men being falsely accused of harassment, assault, et cetera, et cetera. So what does that look like to put that on stage and have it actually be the truth? And I think that is something that I am super excited to dig into more as I move away from doing like really niche plays. And once I start expanding, um, it's just kind of throwing out the book a little bit and casting whoever, but then having those conversations. And I think that's the most important part is that you have to be willing to have those conversations and say, is this harmful? And if yes, how do we reconcile that with our actors and with our audiences? And if no, let's proceed. I, I don't really yeah. know if that answers the question. Um, and I think Alyssa asked that. So Alyssa, if I did not answer your question, if I went off on too much of a tangent, please ask again, ask me to clarify. I'm happy to continue that. 
Star, I want to kind of pivot because this question aligns with um, Alyssa and what we've been talking about. You created Disrupt in 2020, a year of pandemic and a year of sustained national focus on racial injustice. Can you share what stories has felt important for your theater company? You mentioned Lydia R. Diamond's Smart uh, People to tell and um, stories that you'll be sharing this year as well. Yeah, so I'm gonna speak about smart people a little bit because one of, when I first had the idea of Disrupt, I knew that that was the play I wanted to do first. This was again, 2018, 2019, life was fine. We were all outside having fun with our friends. And then 2020 happened and we all knew that it was an election year, big election, right? And Smart People deals with Barack Obama's first candidacy in 2008. And I had already promised myself that we were going to do the show in 2020. And I said to myself, well, I don't need to change it then because it's an election year and it's very poignant and it, it makes sense. So I think mm -hmm. one of the goals, one of the unintentional goals that came out of that was bringing shows that speak about the times that we're in. I'm not ready to do a pandemic play, maybe maybe next year, um, <laughs> once we're all outside and maybe it would be cool to do like a split stage and have people on their computers like doing virtual mm -hmm. dates or something like that. Um, but I think that it's important for me to just expose the creativity of black people. Um, and I, I think that as far as the racial injustice goes, there's something to be said for creativity, black creativity and black art being re absolutely revolutionary. Um, visual, the visual arts have just exploded in the last year, murals, graffiti, um, and that's like, that spans race, race and ethnicity. I, I've seen it from white artists, black artists, mm -hmm. Hispanic, Latinx artists, et cetera, et cetera, especially here in Lancaster, where we have a very prolific visual art scene. And I think that the performing arts fit so well in that too. Um, so one of the one of the best shows I saw this year virtually was this the story of Antigone done by Theater of War, and Theater of War is amazing. You should look them up. They do um, like reimagined adaptations of classic plays or new works. They're really really great, and they all lately in 2020 they've been doing a lot of like star. I call them star studded, but it's just because. To me, those people are like the star-studded people. Um, and I, I saw Antigone and it was, not only was it Antigone, it was Antigone and Ferguson, right? So we, we are six years separated from the Ferguson uprising and the start of the Black Lives Matter organization and movement. And to watch Cori Bush give the pre-show speech was I'm getting, oh, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about how powerful of an experience that was. And there was, I think there was like St. Louis gospel choir or a church gospel choir that Yeah, there was sang, a church gospel. Mm -hmm. And they, I forget, I forget what song they sang, but they sang interspersed through the show. And it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen because at that, I forget when exactly it was. I don't know if I think it was slightly after the national protest started after the murder of George Floyd. I think it was after that or maybe slightly before it, but to really connect those dots, right? From 2014 in Ferguson to 2020 nationwide. And here's a show about a, a, a man who was wrongfully killed, but it's a classic play. Nobody knows Antigone. I never read it. But it's this classic play of loss and family and hope and the pursuit of closure. And I'm like, that is what our, this fight for racial equity is. And that's kind of what we fight for in different, different sectors, I think. So to bring that on stage and bring it accessibly, I don't even remember how much those tickets cost. I, it was they were probably... Free. 
it was free, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So exactly like, <laughs> and it starred Tracy Toms, who is amazing. She's been on Broadway. She's been in movies. She's been on TV and it starred Oscar Isaac. He's now been in Star Wars multiple times. He's done so many works. And it's all these people who are like stage trained in their younger years and have gone on to have really prolific careers. But to be able to sit on my couch and text Bonnie while we were watching it and cry about it and see these actors tell this story was so important. And that's that's just what I want to do. I, I'm confident. I am confident. Every single one of you can quote me on this. I'm confident that as we move past where it's unsafe to be together, as, as things start opening back up, as the vaccine takes hold as people become healthy again, as work conditions become safe. I promise you digital theater will still exist for this very reason. And it is my hope that more theaters will offer hybrid options because again, right, that's accessibility. So we know how to film theater. Hamilton proved to us that we can film theater. Also fun fact, every single show on Broadway is filmed. Every single show. They are locked in a vault in the bottom of the New York Public Library. Every single show that has been on Broadway, they're accessible. They just don't want to give it to us. They, the producing companies don't want to give it to us because then they lose money, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm hoping and I'm praying and I'm, I'm pursuing this idea that a hybrid theater model will take hold and people can be in person if they want. And then we'll have, three cameras set up and it'll be live, live stream to your TV. If you just want to stay at home, if the weather's bad, if you have an injury, if you have limited mobility, you can still access th those shows. I don't think there's any reason for people to not be able to see theater if it's, unless it's not available. Right. Mm -hmm. So that is my, that is my hope. And I probably just answered like four questions ahead because I think you're going to ask me later what my big big goal is um yes <laughs> but yeah I think that Don't skip. I think I, I won't sorry um <laughs> so yeah I think that stories that that speak to the moment we're in stories that speak to the people who are our leaders who are pinnacles I think those are going to be ones that I really want to focus on and then shows that are about regular people doing regular stuff I think there's something to be said for any show starring a teenager um, and any topic really I think that's just kind of my my goal yeah. star I want to um, just take it again to our audience and say I have a few more questions for star but we love hearing your questions as well um, so if you have questions if star has said anything that resonated with you if you have thoughts, comments, please do put them in the chat. Um, while you do that, I will ask Star my next question. Uh, Star, what are three ways that theater companies can reimagine right now? And you and you spoke to it a little bit, um, but if you wanna get specific and just give me three ways um, that theater companies can reimagine right now. We'd love to hear yeah. your thoughts. I've literally answered this um, <laughs> and I will, I will repeat all of these until I'm blue in the face, until the cows come home. <laughs> Um, hire black people, hire brown people, hire non-black people of color, hire indigenous people, um, hire trans folks, hire queer folks, hire lesbian folks, gay folks, bisexual folks. Um, there is so much to be said for experiences of people who don't look like you. Right. And that, like, I'm preaching to myself also. I think it's, I know it's very easy for me to get wrapped up in like, oh, black people, black people, black people, black people, because that's my lens and that's my experience. Um, for very particular example, Disrupt is about to launch our play reading club and we're starting in two weeks and almost every single play I had on our list was written by a black person. There's one that was written by a white man, but he's gay. So I was like, that's a marginalized identity. Um, and my friend Maria from Teatro Paloma contacted me and she was like, Hey, I was looking at your list. Like, this looks so cool. Did you mean to not have any Latinx playwrights? And I was so embarrassed. 
And I mm-hmm. apologize. I was like, Maria, I'm so sorry. And she's like, you don't have to apologize. It's like, there's so many good plays on your list. I'm not mad. And I was like, I, I was like, I understand that you're not mad. I'm embarrassed that for all of my preaching to white people, I missed it. And I mean, we're all human, right? Like no one's mm-hmm. perfect, but it, it really struck a chord with me. And I was so grateful that she said something to me because I was just like, yes, black people, this is going to be awesome. There's so many women on this list. There's a gay guy. Like, this is going to be so Mm -hmm. great. We're going to have great conversations. And then it was just something that I completely missed. So having those people in your life, whether that is, excuse me, whether that's formally as a part of a season selection committee, or whether those people are your friends, having those people who can speak into the work that you're doing um, is so, so, so important. And it's not, I've given this lecture before to white theater people and I'm like, it's not hard. Like, first of all, anyone who knows me knows me and I'm hireable. I just got hired this past week to do a script consultation for Prima, actually the theater I was speaking about earlier. And at the end, the executive director practically begged me to send him an invoice and I was like okay <laughs> fine <laughs> he was like no seriously and he was like I was like I will I will though um so it's not difficult to do you just have to do it um and that goes for designers I have seen I have seen the opening day of a show a very popular show here in in Lancaster where a b- beautiful black actress was dead center stage down in front singing and she wasn't lit from the front. She was only lit from the top down and from the back and I couldn't see her face. And I was like, this was lighting designed by a white person <laughs> and, and it was, but these are the things that run through my head. You have, to, you have to hire people who know how to work with darker skinned people. And there's a really great article out there. I forget, I forget where it's from. Um, about the lighting of Moonlight, the film Moonlight that came out a number of years ago, a few years ago, 2016, 2017, I think. Beautiful film. And they talk about like lighting black people for, for the screen. So mm-hmm. it's like, it's, it doesn't start and stop with the actors. I, I have my director's hat on a lot. I have my actor hat on a lot too, but it it's the designers, it's the producers, it's, everyone involved should bring something that bring a part of their identity to their work and that should show up on stage number two is what I've been yelling about making theater financially accessible um capitalism people have to make money I get it but there are there are ways and 2020 has shown that there are ways that we can do this. Um, Mm -hmm. I would have paid, I would have paid money, money in quarantine to see that theater of war show to see Antigone and Ferguson. Like I would have paid actual real money, but they chose to have it be free. And okay. That's like, that's, the beginning and the end of that example because they didn't have to do that. They could have made so much money and they chose not to. It's all about choices, right? Um, Number three is kind of what I was touching on earlier, like intentionally breaking down barriers and misconceptions about your theater or your local theater community. I just think that there's no... I... I used to be of the mindset that like going to the theater, as I talked about before is expensive, but also like, it's a fancy, I kind of grew up with it being kind of like a treat and like a fancy event. Um, So, you know, my mom would always be like, all right, like dress nice, put on a dress or like some nice pants and nice shoes and a button down, whatever. So in my brain, and I've, I've finally in the last like five or six years have started retraining my brain about what to wear to the theater I have gone to New York in dresses and heels I have gone to New York and sat in a Broadway show soaking wet in the rain this this is a true story 
Um, it was a Wednesday in October <laughs> in 2019. And I, on a whim the night before, bought a bus ticket to New York. And I was like, all right, I'm going to go see Beautiful, the Carol King musical, because it's about to close on Sunday and I have off school today. So I'm just going to go. I ended up not getting tickets to see Beautiful. Another theater regret. I should have just, I should have bought them beforehand instead of trying to be a hero and saving money and rushing the show. See, this is the whole thing, right? Like this is, it's all together. Um, and it, the instant I stepped off the bus, it started pouring down rain. And I was like wearing a hat and jeans and like a jacket and I think like a sweatshirt or something and my boots. And I ended up seeing a show in a Broadway theater and I sat in the very back row of the orchestra section and I was freezing cold. I was dripping wet. Everything was wet. My backpack, like I had books and scripts in there and magazines that were just ruined. And I was like, you know what? If this does not scream, you can wear anything to the theater and no one will judge you. I don't know what does because everyone was having that same experience, right? Theater is about the human experience. And I think that the more we bring that sentence to people, the more accessible it will become. I don't, I don't need people to dress up for an opening night. You can come in jeans. I don't, it's fine. Like you can wear, or you can wear like your fancy dress. That's also fine. Um, I just think that breaking down those misconceptions is going to be the biggest hurdle for me in particular with what I'm doing with Disrupt. Um, and I'm excited for the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Star, we just have a few more moments together today. I have two more questions for you. And again, um, for the members in our audience, if you have questions, please do put them in the chat. We'll open up here in a little bit for um, intentional questions. Um, Star, can you speak a little bit about what dreams you have for Disrupt? What dreams you have for the broader theater industry? And then after, we'll talk a little bit about how people can support you in your work. Sure. So I, I think I've really, that, that has been my whole 48 minutes here. It's like, this is what I want. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just dream of a theater world that is truly welcoming. You know, we talk a lot in, in the industry about how theater is accepting of everyone. And it's the place where you can go to really be seen and really be heard and be yourself. I have watched kids really come into their own on stage and who they are as young adults. Um, I have watched adults work through hard things on stage. I've worked through hard things in rehearsals. Um, I had to, I had to sing a song in Big, I had to sing that solo in Big River two days after the murder of Philando Castile. I had to sing about being a slave and I'm intentionally using that term, being a slave and dreaming of freedom as we were mourning the loss of Philando Castile and Sandra Bland and so many others we lost in 2016. Um, and I, I think that in order to actually be the place where everyone can belong and everyone can thrive and find their voice, we have to, divest from whiteness and capitalism. Um, I mean, we're, we're stuck. <laughs> and I, I like, I, in a, a lot of the work I do with the YWCA, I'm an anti-oppression facilitator. So we talk a lot about capitalism and white supremacy culture and what that looks like at a Mac and a, at a micro level, but also what that looks mm -hmm. like in a macro level, we're all stuck here. So, but there are those of us across any industry who can kind of chisel away at that, at that mountain mm -hmm. bit by bit, I think that we will eventually get to the point where everything will be accessible. Everything will be free. Um, everything will be community oriented as well. So that is, that is my hope, at least for here in Lancaster. Um, so far, so good. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> In 2020, I'm already thinking about 2022. Um, mm -hmm. We have some great things coming up this this year. I don't have a formal season because we just didn't really know what 2021 was going to be. Um, so 2022, I'm confident that we will be able to all be together, and that that's going to be my driving my driving force is what 
Yeah. Like, how do we make this open and able mm-hmm. and welcoming, intentionally welcoming for everyone? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's kind of for the broader theater industry and for Disrupt, I just dream of that day. Yeah. Star, I want to go to our audience. Um, if there's any questions, we want to hold space for a few minutes um, and then we'll ask Star how we can support her, how we can follow her. She's mentioned um, they're doing a lot of stage readings this year. Um, so we want to get specific. Tell us about your Instagram, your Facebook, um, how we can follow you. But first, let's see if there's any questions in the chat. We'll hold space here for just a few moments to see if anything pops up for you. Um, go ahead and put that in there. Again, you can send that to all panelists and attendees. Um, we want to hear from you. Okay. Um, we are not getting any questions right now, Star. You have just, oh, maybe we do. <laughs> um, one minute here. Let's see. Looks like we got one question. Okay, Star, are you working um, with any youth programs to encourage the next generation? So a problem that I've put off until March <laughs> <laughs> because that is just the way 2020 is going, um, is filing for our nonprofit paperwork. And hopefully by the end of the summer, we will be officially a nonprofit here in the state of Pennsylvania. And part of that mission is an education arm. I have had about a half a dozen ideas of what that looks like <laughs> since the inception of Disrupt. But the three that keep coming back to me are um, a college audition prep program, uh the landscape is changing finally thank goodness the landscape is changing so in the theater world specifically the collegiate theater world every time a new group of musical theater uh actors students come into a theater program usually the facebook page is like welcome class of 2020 whatever 20 whatever um and it used to just be all white and maybe one light brown person and then like usually one black tenor and like that was it um and thankfully that is changing but we talk a lot about accessibility and why why are the white theater white college theater programs so white and a lot of that is because traditionally white communities more affluent communities have access to voice teachers, have access to audition coaches, have access to theater camps starting at age five. Um, and I, that's something that I have to recognize my privilege. And I grew up in a white family and I had access to those opportunities. And that's how I kind of was able to build my way up, but not everybody has that. So one of my goals for Disrupt is to partner with local elementary schools and get them, get the kids involved. And a lot of the schools in our area do a spring, like a fun spring musical. Um, and I, you know, I picture myself being the person that is like, that goes in and poaches actors. <laughs> like, but at age six, that's not really appropriate. Um, <laughs> you can't really do that with a kindergartner <laughs> and have it be successful, as successful as I want it to be. Um, so, I kind of re I want to do that, but then I was thinking a lot about these high schoolers. We have a huge high school here in Lancaster, um, JP McCaskey. And even when I was in high school, two counties away, I knew about the McCaskey theater and music program. They were, they are always phenomenal. They're always doing wonderful shows. And in my brain, I'm like, why aren't these kids? Like, I don't know these kids. I don't work at McCaskey, but are these kids given the opportunity to pursue theater as a career or as a, as a field of study in college? And what does that look like to excite these kids about auditioning for college programs? My friends who auditioned for musical theater college programs told me nightmare stories about the process and they are trained white people. <laughs> so I'm mm-hmm. like, if the trained white people are having nightmare processes, going through all these auditions, what's happening to the black kids and the brown kids? And I really want Disrupt to kind of be that feeder 
to these collegiate programs. All right, great. Come in as a junior. We'll talk about the audition process. I'll learn as I go because I didn't I didn't actually have to audition. I just changed my major as a junior in college. So I don't know what that looks like. Um, we'll talk about it. We'll look at each and every school. I'll get you set up with a voice teacher who can help you. I can help you with the monologue process. I'll, I'll get you set up with a dance teacher who can help you and we can set you up for success. Um, so that is one of the biggest things that I'm, I'm looking to do within the next year or so. Of course, it's too late now because a lot of college acceptances are rolling in, which is great. Um, and the other thing I'm going to do is like an apprentice, apprenticeship program. I have so many talented friends. Um, I have friends who are, I have a lighting designer who's a woman of color. My friend Sophia, who is an equity stage manager, is Korean American. And I just want to connect all of the cool people in my life with younger people who are just learning about theater. The stage isn't for everyone. Like acting is not for everybody. And I, I respect that greatly. I have designed shows, I have choreographed shows, I have directed shows, and really where I feel most comfortable is directing and acting. And it, but it took a while for me to like get there and a lot of failure um, and a lot of tears and panic attacks, but I, but I know that I never wanna be a stage manager. Um, so I want to connect and like do like a mentorship apprenticeship program with younger, younger people or even older people who are just looking for something to do and train people in lighting design, sound design, whatever that, whatever their passion is, and whatever that looks like. So, so yeah. There was a follow-up to that one. Um, Elizabeth Bressy says, are you familiar with uh, Philly Young playwrights? And then, um, and that's something maybe just to tuck in um, back of your head. I wanna to go to the next question here. It says, at what stages in a writing process would you recommend bringing in people to consult? We're thinking of writing a script and we wanna make sure that we decenter whiteness as the default and not as an afterthought. Sure, so um, I have heard of Philly Young Playwrights. I am right down, I'm right up the road from Philly, basically. Lancaster's an hour and a half north. I have family in Philly. Um, I think the Philly theater scene is prolific. The Wilma. If I could quit my job and go work at the Wilma full-time, I would. Um, I love, love, love what they do. They have done some really fantastic digital programs and they're continuing that model into 2021. Um, I, yeah, so I will definitely put that in the back of my mind. Um, as far as consultation, I say from the moment you have the idea, you should be bringing in those people. Um, I have, I did a script consultation a few weeks ago of a completed script and it was quite honestly a nightmare. The script was a nightmare. The story was a nightmare. Everything was awful. And there was extreme tension in those moments. But it had this person contacted, had this white male playwright contacted a black woman at the beginning of his process, he wouldn't have, hopefully wouldn't have bothered writing it incorrectly or writing it at all. So I think that there, there's something to be said of bringing in people right at the beginning. Um, and then as soon as you have any scenes done, always give it to people to read. Um, Lancaster has the Dramatist platform, which is wonderful. And I think that we, we have playwrights from Philly and we have playwrights from other places, but that is a really good place to start, just so you can hear your words um, being read by actors. So yeah, I say immediately or at least halfway through. Yeah, start, um, I wanna open it up to Alyssa and bring her back in um, so that we can kind of close out and thank everyone so much for their time and attention. I also wanna just ask you, how can we support you? How can we follow Disrupt Theater? What, um, tell us a little bit about your plans for the year. Um, we wanna just you know, follow you on Instagram. We wanna give you, give you our attention and our money <laughs> and hopefully our business. Yes, so um, because other things have had my attention. <laughs> we do not have a website yet, but that is also March's problem. I put off a lot of things until March. That's gonna 
come back to haunt me in about three and a half weeks where I'm like, oh, I promised myself I was going to do this this month. Um, we do not have a website yet, but we do have a Facebook page, um, facebook.com slash, I mean, you search it, Disrupt Theater Company. Thank you, Tane. She's ready. She's on it. Um, we, something that nobody told me that I will just pass along for good general information is that like, it takes a lot of work to open a small business bank account. I had no idea. I have tried to open up a bank account for Disrupt three times in the last two months and it has not worked. Um, so we are currently taking donations via PayPal, paypal.com, paypal.me slash disrupt theater co. Um, so we'll take donations there. And then once I get a bank account, it'll all go in there. Um, you can follow me. I have a Facebook page, Starlisha Michelle Gingrich. Um, I have a website www.starlisha.com my consultation fees are on there my general life information my bio is on there uh, things that I'm working on upcoming speaking events etc um we don't have an Instagram because again that is something that I'm <laughs> planning on doing later um I'm gonna so as soon as yeah, that's probably a summer thing. I'm going to hire, I have a social media person who is coming on in the next week or so. So our Facebook page is about to get real cool and Gen Z and hip. <laughs> um, I'm just going to also redirect my attention. I want everyone to follow Epic Theater Company. They have the best memes about everything. My dear, dear friend, Kevin Broccoli is the executive director at Epic Theater Company up in Providence, Rhode Island. He is a delight he has taught me so much about this process. Um, and if you go to the Epic Theater Company page, there's actually an interview I did with him um, a few months ago. I think I did that in December and that's on there. It's a very different tone than the interview that Bonnie and I have just engaged in. Kevin has a weekly talk show called The Drag where he basically just drags people for ridiculous things that have happened in the week or in the news or whatever. So it's a very different tone, but still along the same lines of talking about Disrupt and our, our mission and the mission of um, Epic as well. So yeah, I, I'm kind of all over the place. Feel free to reach out to me on my website. My contact information is there and I'd be happy to further the conversation in any way. Wonderful. Alyssa, I'm gonna pivot back to you. Thank you so much for inviting us today. Thank you for everyone who has attended today. We are so appreciative that you took time out of your day to spend an hour and a half, a little bit over an hour with us. Um, <laughs> all right, Alyssa. Thank you all so much for being here with us. This was an incredible conversation. I am so honored that we get to be one of the first places that gets to host the Disrupt Theater. Um, and that in a couple of years when you are taking the nation by storm and everyone's looking to you as a model of how to do this, that we can say, you saw it here first, folks. Uh, <laughs> we have the YouTube video to prove I love it. it. <laughs> this will be up on YouTube um, shortly, probably in the next week or two. Uh, so if you want to share this with other people you know and say, hey, guess what is going on in Lancaster? You can check it out there. Um, once again, thanks to Comcast for giving us some support so that we can have a tech platform and bring voices like this to you for free. If you would like to contribute um, and, and give a donation to the Alice Paul Institute so we can do even more of this, um, that uh, link to our donate page in our website is in the chat box. And on next Thursday, February 18th, I would love for you all to join us for our meetup series, which is a Zoom meeting where you can talk and see each other's faces with Jovita Hill, who is the president of the Philadelphia Mayor's um, Commission on Women, Office Commission on Women. She is going to be talking about the erasure of women of color and the suffrage movement and the way that we can combat that erasure and um, unerase is the term she uses as we move forward in our gender equity and social justice work. So thank you again, Star and Bonnie. It has been such a pleasure to have you with us. And I really hope that we can see each other in person before too long. Yeah, thank hopefully. You. Thank, you, thank, thank you, you so much for having us. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day, gals. And Happy Valentine's Day. Hi. I love it. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>